What's going on, everybody? Uh, episode number three of Chill Out and Talk. Today we have Miss Frances Reimers, who is a businesswoman that is in the marketing and brand building space. Uh, she was very gracious to come on and talk to me about her business, Firestarter. Miss um, Reimers is uh, been on lots of different uh, shows and podcasts and like big time stuff. We're gonna get into that. And she took the time to come on my little podcast and talk to me. Really appreciate her coming on. So without further ado, Miss Reimers. All right, everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, I have Miss Reimers. Is that saying that correctly? Yes. Okay, so Miss Reimers is here. Uh, I'm just going to read uh, her bio real quick, just a little thing about her. Um, so Francis Reimers, the founder and CEO of Firestarter, a personal brand consultancy located in Alexandria, Virginia, has helped some of the country's leading high school, collegiate, and professional athletes, coaches, and sports executives develop, manage, enhance, and protect one of their most critical professional assets, their personal brands. So Ms. Reimers, thank you again for coming on. Uh, kind of random I kind of hit you up on Twitter to come on and talk a little bit uh, I just I think that the space that you work in is amazing and so I want to come on and talk to you but uh don't you talk, tell us a little bit about who you are sure so yep I'm Francis Reimers I'm the founder and CEO of Firestarter which is a personal brand consultancy um I've been in the area of marketing PR and events for over 22 years now and about 7 years ago I decided to leave an advertising agency that I was working at to start my own firm to focus solely on athletes and coaches because I saw as we were living more and more of our lives online that this was a service that athletes and coaches needed they needed someone who knew the strategic side as well as the artistic side of putting your life out there for public consumption. And so I launched my firm with that purpose. Okay. So, so let's find out who you are outside of that. So wh where did you, where are you from? Like I thought I found that you were from Wyoming. Is that correct? Yes. Born and raised in Wyoming, went okay. to the university of Wyoming. Um, and then I, finished there and moved to Minnesota and lived in Minnesota for a while um, and went back to school and, and got degrees at Minnesota. And then after graduation, I was working at a nonprofit in Minnesota and got a call randomly for a job opportunity outside the DC metro area. And I'd always wanted to live in DC. So I took the job offer and 20 plus years later, I'm still here. That, yeah, I was wondering, I was like, how does she go from Wyoming to <laughs> Virginia? I mean, that's kind of, usually people around here are like, oh yeah, let's go out to the Plains. Let's go out to Montana, Wyoming, <laughs> you know, the, the great outdoors. But like UK, you did the opposite. So I thought it was kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not outdoorsy. I'm a city person. I don't, I don't do any outdoor activities. I don't hike. I don't bike. I don't camp. I don't, nope. Uh, roughing it for me is, you know, staying at a three-star hotel and I don't, I don't do anything outdoors except uh, occasional uh, deep sea fishing and golf. That's uh, besides those two, that's all you're going to get me to do outdoors. Yeah. I saw you put out a tweet. You were like, when people ask you, why don't you come up to Wyoming in the winter? And you put like a picture of just snow. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. it's miserable and unsafe to drive sometimes. Oh. Yeah, um, I'm sure they're more prepared than we are here, especially on the East Coast, though, because yeah. we just shut down here. Yes. Um, so let's talk about your passion for marketing. You know, that's that's what it's, that's the space you work in. Uh, what brought that about? Like what what growing up inspired you to want to do that? So I grew up in a family run business. Uh, my mom had a retail store in my hometown and so I was around sales and marketing and, and public relations pretty much from the second I was born. And so marketing to me felt more like second nature than an actual educational pursuit. Um, uh, my, my first college degree is actually in criminology. So the destination was not really marketing. I didn't really decide to go into marketing until after my senior year of college. Uh, the destination for me was always to be an attorney. And 
you know, life just happens. And I fell into job opportunities that were marketing. And to me, it just all came very easy. The concept of developing a message, understanding your audience, tailoring your message to the audience, um, using different delivery methods to get to your audience, um, all of that, that kind of lather, rinse, repeat that marketing can be. Uh, to me, it was just common sense. Um, I never took marketing classes. I've never taken public relations classes. I've never taken any of that. It just all, um, you know, some people are naturally athletically gifted and they just hit the road running. Um, I, I guess the equation of that for me was marketing and PR and putting together events and getting people to come to things and do things was just kind of a natural thing for me. And, and when I started getting handed opportunities to hone my skills in this space, I just um, took the ball and, and, and just kind of ran with it. And um, many, many, many years later, um, that's, that's worked out for me. I it's marketing is fun. It's interesting. It's the rules and principles, a lot like coaching football, right? The rules and principles have not ever changed. I mean, coaching football has kind of been coaching football since God was a boy. The principles of marketing are, are a little bit of the same, no matter if it's print media, uh, digital media, it, 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 the principles and how to do what you do are, are always the same. So um, uh, it's, it's a fun challenge to kind of create and do new things and come up with new and interesting things for my clients, but it's always interesting for me to help my clients get past whatever roadblock they have. Um, marketing and content creation, especially for some of my coach clients, is really tough because their brain just doesn't go there. They don't think that way. Um, and so helping them kind of get out of their own way and learn how to make authentic content for themselves without me having to do it for them um, is a huge reward because that's that's taking something that somebody didn't think they could do and teaching them what I know and and then being able to do it for themselves. So marketing is is fun, but but the rules and and the kind of the game plan for marketing has has always been the same. Yeah. So you took the those tools and those those rules of marketing and you decided to put it in a business and, and Firestarter uh, is what you came up with. Talk about the, the just the genesis of Firestarter. What kind of gave you the idea to want to do that and uh, why you wanted to go more of the sports route? So it, it was all very spur of the moment. I have to be honest. I know a lot of people spend a lot of money to go to business school and, and learn that you have to create a business plan and you have to have all of these documents um, uh, and all this thought and preparation um, my company was as developed over a weekend. Um, I sat down one Friday night and, and called up my attorney and was like, how hard is it to start a business? And he was like, oh, it's not really hard at all. You just have to fill out some paperwork. And I was like, okay, we'll stand by your phone in the next you know, couple of hours. I'll be sending you the information to put this paperwork together for me. And I came up with the name in an instant. Um, I, I wanted a name that evoked action um, and brand building, you know, needs a fire starter. Some people need that flame to be lit underneath them uh, to get them off the blocks to get going with their brand. And so uh, fire starter was what I went with and the handles were available. The URL was available. So I purchased everything up and sent it over to my attorney. And the next day I, I sat down with a friend and we put together the website in just a matter of, of hours. I knew what I wanted to say. I knew what, what I wanted it to look like and bing, bing, boom, it, it came together. And, and literally by, by the time I walked back into the office on Monday, uh, I had a brand new company to show my current boss. And I knew that I wanted to go into sports, not because I was an athlete. I was not an athlete. I was a theater kid and a debate kid and student government um, athletics beyond like seventh grade was not my jam. Um, but my older brother is an athlete. My ex-husband is an athlete. I have tons and tons of athlete friends. 
Um, when I worked at the agency, I had worked with the Nationals. I had worked with the the then Redskins. Um, so I had a lot of athletes and coaches and and people just in my network naturally, and I was seeing through the people that I knew, the people that I had worked with in in previous lives, that there wasn't anybody out there doing what I was proposing to do, which was basically being a marketing agency for individual athletes. So taking the agency culture, the full service agency culture that a company or nonprofit or even a sports team would hire and scaling that down and and selling it to individual athletes. Nobody was doing that. And so I was going to do it. Um, and I'd been in the agency space for a long time. So I knew, you know, how to scale scale the prices down, how to bring in the resources. Um, and there's, you know, seven years ago, there was just nobody really, there were marketing agencies, sports agents, publicists, a few brand managers out there, but there was not anyone out there being like, I can literally do everything for you. Anything you want done. You want videos done, graphic design done. You want press. I got you. If you want help building a nonprofit, I got you. Um, there was nobody out there doing that. And so I saw a hole in the market and, and hurried up and planted my flag. And, and, you know, seven years later, we're still getting out there and, and gaining businesses, individuals, organizations, like my clients run the gamut of everything from individual athletes all the way up to athlete run organizations and nonprofits and everything in between. So um, it was definitely needed in the marketplace and it was just total right place at the right time. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Especially when you say that, like instead of having five different people to go to or different avenues to have to group together and sort through, you just have your agency and yep. you can touch every avenue that they want and it's a lot easier that, I mean, that's incredible so let's talk about you know i want to get to some nil stuff later but um because you you were sitting right there ahead of the curve when it was coming um but i want to talk about that but let's talk about some some of the clients that you do represent um you know i mean i'm not a big name dropper but that's big for you so who who are like some people you represent so everyone's favorite uh, client that that they love to talk about with me is I do all the marketing and PR for Aaron Donald's foundation in Pittsburgh, AD99 Solutions. So that's that's everyone's favorite to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but I also work with Dietrich Wise of the New England Patriots, um, Chris Paul, the Washington Commanders. Um, of course, uh, everybody uh, knows John Feliciano with the New York Giants, um, an interesting interesting thing about John is I've worked with him for so long and he and I do so many events and activities together throughout the year, both for his brand, but also um, I do things with his wife and his family um, that people will call me and ask me like how he's doing, which is, so, which is so funny. I don't have, I don't have press or other people call me up and ask, about other clients, but they know because I spend so much time uh, with with John and so much time working with John that people will call and and like before the the Giants last playoff game, like people were calling and being like uh, calling and texting and being like, you know, let him know we wish him the best. And and these are people that are not even Giants fans; yeah. they just know him because of, of my work with him and and their you know, passing along their goodwill to him. And so it's, it's, he's a perfect example. My relationship with him is a perfect example of what good can come when you have a dedicated person who is out there, um, uh, you know, banging the drum for you um, and helping you grow your brand is that it, it goes far beyond the, you know, the, okay, he's playing today. That's cool. Like his stuff, when people are actually picking up the phone and calling or texting, you know, sending well wishes for, for me to pass along to him. Um, that's, that's the, the sign that there's good, wholesome, organic things going on here. Now, doesn't he also stream like on Twitch and stuff? 
He does. Yeah. He hasn't he hasn't done it in a minute. Yeah. Um I keep asking him when he's going to get back on that. I don't I don't see it happening anytime soon because yeah. he and his wife have two young kids. Yeah. Um and and usually right when the season ends he goes he goes back into full dad mode but people keep asking me when he's going to uh, start streaming again and i i need to tell him to get back on that because yeah. I, I get asked at least once a week of of when he's going to get back on and do like he did a charity thing on on his twitch and and that was extremely popular and people ask every year if he's going to do that again um and so it, it's twitch is amazing i i i tell this if you, to any athlete or any coach, if you're, if you're a gamer, if this is a pastime of yours and you want to grow your brand, Twitch, Twitch is a phenomenal platform, um, for, for people, uh, to do all kinds of things, but it's a great, it's a great brand builder for sure. Yeah. I was going to ask if if you helped him with that as well. Um, yeah, one-stop shop, you know, Um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So, um, so you're also involved in several civic and philanthropic, I can't say this word, philanthropic. Philanthropic. philanthropic yes. <laughs> yeah. Organizations. Um, can you talk about some of those? Because uh, there's, there's, there's several. Uh, and then what made you want to get into that kind of, do that? I mean, that's kind of outside of your business, but that's like you giving back almost. So uh, talk about that. Yeah. So um, my whole entire career since I graduated college to the present, um, being involved uh, in charitable organizations, giving to charitable organizations have always been um, kind of the cornerstone of my business. Um, I feel, I I mean, I'm incredibly blessed uh, that, you know, through the ups and downs through a global pandemic, um, that I'm still sitting here and able to support a multiple person staff um, and provide the services that I'm able to provide. And so I think all of that is is directly attributed to the fact that I try to give back as, as much as I possibly can. Um, every year I try to give to several charitable organizations. Some of my clients' charities included um, my family charities, my niece and nephew, their sports teams, all of that. I try to give as much as I can to those organizations every year. Um, but also giving of my time and my expertise. There's lots of nonprofits out there that really need talented people to be on their boards, their advisory boards, um, in order to help those organizations do the incredible work that that they do. Um, one of them is Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind. Um, I'll be the first to admit I haven't been as active as I used to be, um, but this is a tremendous organization that helps um, people who are blind or have vision impairment and find them jobs, provide camps, provide resources um, in the in the DC metro area and nationally. Tremendous organization, and um, I got involved with them a million years ago. And to be honest, it's been so long that I've been involved with them. I don't even remember how I got involved or who wrote me into that. Um, but Soldiers to Sidelines, um, that's a great organization that helps former soldiers who want to get into the coaching space. It helps them make that transition, make connections, learn the skills and tools they need to be better coaches. Um, And that's run by a guy that used to be a coach with the Washington then Redskins. Um, Tremendous organization that keeps growing by leaps and bounds every single year. Um, And so for the coaches out there watching this, if you are a former soldier and you want additional resources and opportunities to grow in the coach space, Soldiers of Sidelines is a is a great organization for you to get connected with. So I love to give back. I love to give my time and talents. And, and I'm fortunate living here in the D.C. metro area that there's just literally a slew of organizations to, to get involved with. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, definitely, because especially as a coach, I try to, you know, I'm, I'm always about giving back, you know, mentorship, all sorts of things. So the fact that you are not just satisfied with where you are in your space that you're giving, branching out and doing those other things. That's awesome. I think that's great work. Um, let's transition and let's talk about something that's, you know, obviously NIL is insane. Um, and especially at the college level, obviously, um, with especially let's call it college football, uh, it, it's blowing up. Guys are getting deals left and right. Um, 
they're they're leveraging their their position for their own brands. I think I think it's great. Um, let's talk about how you were ahead of the curve, <laughs> and you know you like I don't know if you saw it coming or anything like that, but you pretty much it ran right into you. And then I know a lot of coaches, let's say college coaches, they see it as a negative, and it, that's what you do. So let's talk about how you see it as a positive, and and how how you use it every day. So yeah, I I I saw this come in uh, a country mile away. I mean, I've been in the brand building business for seven years now, and I, I I saw a hole in the market. I saw the trends moving in this direction. So, I mean, when I first started my company, obviously my my focus was on professional sports, but uh, you know, as as the conversation was evolving with the NCAA, you knew that eventually this was going to get down to the, to the collegiate ranks and, and even lower um, down to the high school level. And so I was again, right place, right time, right skill set to be able to raise my hand and be like, okay, if this is what you're talking about, I'm the person you need to be talking to because this this is literally my business. This is literally what I do all day, every day. Um, And so long before NIL, was a surface level conversation that all of us in the the lay world were talking about. It was happening in the collegiate athletic spaces. And I was already out on the speaker circuit talking to collegiate programs about social media use, engagement with the media, and all of these skills lent itself right into NIL. And so when the NIL conversation was starting to form at the NCAA level, my contacts within individual athletic departments were hitting me up being like, this looks like it's coming. What do you think? What should we do? What should we prepare for? And so I was able at at a lot of different programs to get my foot in the door and be a consultant uh, and be like, okay, th- this is what these kids are going to need. These are the kinds of services they're going to be looking for. This is the kind of stuff agents are going to say they do, but they don't. And so you need to safeguard for these kinds of things. Um, and and being able to be that, that consultant, that resource um, allowed me so much credibility in the space and so much trust Um, A lot of athletic programs were trusting me to know what to do because they didn't know what to do. The NCAA wasn't telling them anything. Um, And so I I became a name that was being passed around to athletic departments as somebody that if you have questions, if you're trying to build something, if you want to bring somebody in to talk to the players, this is somebody to know. And, And so when in July 2021, when NIL finally became law of the land, it it allowed me to open the door up even more and start working with individual uh, student athletes and, you know, answer questions, point them in the direction. The thing about NIL is it's hyper local. You know, everybody is seeing these big, huge deals in, in the news. But for every one football player that you see get this massive contract, there's 30 other guys, 30, 40 other guys on the team that haven't gotten squat. So um, keep in mind that, yes, there are some kids that are really cashing in, but the majority, and when we go beyond football and start talking about women's sports and, and other sports like golf, tennis, lacrosse, that sort of thing, some of these kids are getting nothing. And so, yeah, NIL, there is some major NIL paydays out there, but not for everyone. And that's always the thing that I, I, whenever I'm talking to parents or administrators, that's the stuff that we really need to keep in mind. Yeah, there are some kids that are getting paid and getting paid huge, but the majority of them are not. I think the last time numbers were actually presented, the actual, the actual D1 athlete was only getting about a thousand bucks. Now for all of us who were in college, thousand dollars in college is pretty nice money. Um, but that's not the big, huge paydays that we're seeing in the news. And so that's always a thing for uh, parents and administrators. I always tell them to 
not get too, too, too worried because the vast majority of student athletes are, are not seeing these massive paydays. Um, and some kids, another thing we have to keep in mind, some student athletes could care less about NIL. They're, they're not trying to monetize. They're not trying to be famous. They're just trying to play their sport, go to school and, and move on to whatever is next for them. We shouldn't forget about these athletes in the mix. There's some, and we all know a, a few student athletes that this is why they're playing their sport is because they want to cash in on this NIL payday and fantastic. That's great. But there's a lot more of them that don't really care that they just want to live their life, have fun with their friends, go to school, play their sport and, and move on to whatever is, is next for them in their lives. Um, there are some coaches who are not fans of NIL and, and partly because they're afraid of just the unknown. Um, is it going to cause a disruption in the locker room? Is it going to cause problems between players? Um, but by and large, all, all of these fears that have been pushed out there really haven't come to light. You know, we're not, we're not, you know, when, when NIL first came around, people thought that there were going to be brawls in the locker room and kids were going to be, you know, pulling coaches aside and demanding to know why so-and-so is getting money and, and they're not, this might happen one here, one there with a random kid, but it's not happening in mass. Yeah. Like, like coaches thought, um, the kids are actually, a lot more level headed about this than, than we gave them credit for. They do talk to each other about the money they're getting. They do talk about where this money is coming from, but they're really no fools. They know who's getting what and why so-and-so is getting what. Um, and, and uh, by and large, most of the, the student athletes that I talk to, they get it, they understand it. They get that it's business and the ones that really stand to to profit, they know that their payday will come eventually. Um, they're not choosing schools based off of what that school can do for them regarding NIL. They're still looking at coaching, playing, academics, other things. Um, that's not giving schools permission to do away with focusing on NIL because they shouldn't. But we have to give these, these young men and women a little more credit that they they know what's going down a, with a lot more sophistication than than we originally gave them credit for. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, they can they see that there's a hierarchy, and it's like, well, this guy is a five star. He's been playing all for four years. He's really good. He's gonna get the money. I mean, just like if it was take away nil, just like playing time. That guy's really good. He's gonna start over me. It's the same thing. So I, I, that's a very interesting point you made. Like, these kids aren't stupid. They know who's good, who's not. And it's not everybody at the bottom trying to be like, hey, where's my handout? They're like, yeah, I mean, I'm not that good. Like, maybe I should work harder. So, yeah. Well, definitely. And, and, and what a lot of people forget, brand building ain't easy. Yeah. Um, you know, brand building, just like saving money, losing weight, um, you know, learning a foreign language. Brand building takes time and effort and dedication. You don't wake up one morning and you're a star just because you created an Instagram account. It doesn't work that way. And these kids, because they are digitally native, they've lived their whole lives. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm in my middle forties. I didn't have my space until I was, you know, at the end of, end of college. And so, but these kids were born with this. And they know, they know that, that building a following, becoming an influencer, getting that visibility takes time and takes work. And some of them, and like I mentioned before saying, some of them just don't care about NIL, NIL because some of them realize, man, this is a lot of work having to take these pictures, especially for the females, having to always look camera ready and these sorts of things that takes time and energy. And so some of them have just dipped out from NIL simply because of the time, effort, and and um, all that that is involved in it. Okay, so uh, we're kind of trying to wind it down, kind of wrap it up a little bit. Uh, so, what what's what's what does the future hold for Miss Rhymers and Firestarter? You don't have to give away anything that's like uh, down <laughs> unlocked, but 
what what is the next what's the next vision Oh gosh. I mean, the next vision is just to keep growing. Um, I, you know, in the next year, I would like to sign a lot more female athletes and get more involved in, in women's athletics a lot more. I've been in the football space for a really long time, but I I'd really like to start representing more female athletes. And, you know, the, the, the plan here is to just keep growing Firestarter to the point of where I either um, get tired and decide to retire or somebody buys me out because um, uh, I, I, I love what I do every day. So uh, there's there's no uh, decision to uh, quit anytime soon unless I win the lottery or something. Uh, yeah. But this is a fun ride that I'm on. So the next, you know, three, five, seven years, I really don't see myself doing doing anything different. So uh, this is a question I kind of ask everybody I, I have on, um, and it's just, it's, it's random, but if you could give one standard piece of advice to, to somebody, somebody like that, Ms. Rymers, I'm going through something. Can you give me a piece of advice? Maybe something that's helped you in your career. It could be about anything. What was, what is one standard piece of advice that you would give to somebody? Oh my gosh. The, the best advice I, that's been given to me and that I pass along is People do not think about you nearly as much as you think they do. So when you make a mistake, you you put something out that that's corny or doesn't land right or, um, you know, something doesn't go right in your career or you're going through a phase, whatever the case may be. You know, we're because we're spending so much of our lives online, we think that people are sitting back you know, raking over our mistakes and, and finding ways to, you know, throw us under the bus. And and that's just not really at the end of the day, people have their own lives and their own issues. So if you make a mistake, grieve on it for a second, but pick yourself up and get back in the game and keep fighting because there is no Calvary coming for you. So make sure that whatever you're doing, you back yourself 150% and let all mistakes be in the rearview mirror so that you can stay present and focused on, on what is destined for you up ahead. Well, Ms. Rymers, I really appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and just like, I'm a small town, I'm a small time outfit right now. And I just, I love conversation. I love stories. And I just wanted to learn a little bit about you and also not just have a bunch of guys on. I wanted to have a, a, woman, <laughs> yeah. a professional woman on that could talk about what the space that she dominates and like guys like she's been and she's been mentioned in Forbes Huntington Post like she was on seeing his live with Pierce Morgan but she came on to talk to me and talk to us about what she does in her life and her passion and I cannot thank you more than enough for coming on and talking to little old us I really do appreciate it thank you for having me on thank you yeah, everything around me. <laughs>